Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're discussing early childhood development and how to support families and children through those crucial early years with special guests, Alejandra Barraza, the president of the High Scope Educational Research Foundation in Ypsilanti, Michigan, Diana Rauner, president of the Start Early program in Chicago, and Drew Ferretti, President and CEO of Para Los Niños in Los Angeles. So Alejandra, I'm just going to set you up with, with just the fact that the first five years of a child's life are so key to social, emotional, and cognitive development. So let's talk about those first five years and how organizations like yours uh, support children and families in, in helping uh, those children develop and in giving them a good start. Thank you so much, Mark, and for inviting us to this conversation. As you mentioned, uh, I am the president of High Scope Educational Research Foundation. We have been in service since 1970. So this is, last year was our 50th anniversary. And we have, through research, we've been able to develop an approach an approach that really is focused on active learning in the classroom. And we've been able to develop not only for preschool students, but also our infant toddlers, because we know that really the benefits of early childhood start from birth and go all the way till third grade. I think that's always an important piece to understand that early learning happens all the way until third grade. So at high scope, uh, through our research that started with the uh, High Scope Perry Preschool Study in 1962, where our founder, David Weikert, was able to identify 123 Black children from the community of Ypsilanti that were, through the school system, identified to be uh, possibly at risk. He offered them a different setting and offered them an early childhood program throughout five years, and they were able to identify what are the pieces that make a high quality program. And um, we are very happy to share that this longitudinal study of these uh, 123 children who are now our grandparents, we have seen the benefit of investing in early childhood. And so we continue to work with these individuals and to understand that when the community invests about $1 for uh, in early childhood, the return upon investment can be up to seven to $13. And this is also with some of the work that Dr. Uh, James Heckman from the University of Chicago has followed this work and um, has received a Nobel laureate by, by encouraging people to invest in, in early childhood. I love the story. I love the fact that it started off with evidence, with the idea of, a, a, of figuring out what actually works and what doesn't. Mm -hmm and the impact. And before we got on uh, to, to the open uh, mic, Diana, you made a great point about finances, which Alejandra just uh, just set you up for. Could you just make that point that you made uh, previously with us? Sure. So the, the research that Alejandra is describing is, um, is seminal in our field. But what's so exciting about it is that Dr. Heckman has looked at the research or the impact of the Perry Preschool Program throughout the life cycle of the attendees and found that it has an impact on their children. So what's really exciting is that the parents who attended preschool are actually different people because of that, they're different parents and their children are different children, which really suggests really the power of early learning. As we all know, brains are, um, are dynamic and they are interactive with environment. What's so exciting about investing in early learning is the opportunity to change the trajectory of children's lives and the trajectory of their children's lives and so forth and so forth. So it's one of the reasons why we at Start Early are so committed to supporting parents and children in the first five years of life. And we at Start Early actually start even before birth. We begin with prenatal programs to ensure that young moms are physically, emotionally, and practically prepared to be um, effective parents, a strong attachment figures. We work and support parents through home visiting programs, voluntary programs that support families, whatever kind of families they are, moms, dads, grandparents, any sort, as well as creating high quality early learning programs for children out of home. 
At Start Early, we are um, we describe ourselves as trilingual in program policy and research. We run programs directly. We train and support other providers to make sure that all the settings that we uh, the children are in are high quality early learning settings. And we advocate and work with other partners to ensure that additional funding is coming to early learning. And this is a very exciting day because uh, the um, um, president has just announced the, his Build Back Better reconciliation package, which we think is inching over the finish line. But what's so exciting about it is that the centerpiece of this is a huge investment in early learning um, and a huge investment in preschool, in childcare, and in the child tax credits, which are a very, very important uh, source of family support. You know, one of the things that, that um, we find in our society is that we devalue and have off the books the return on investment of certain types of investment, yet count other types of investment. From your perspective, from your financial analytical perspective, what is the return of investment of a dollar in a child today that will affect that child's life, but also the children, their children and their children's children? What, what is that? Now, I'm really not, this is not a tongue in cheek and I know it's a little bit of a setup. It's not tongue in cheek. I, 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 talk a little bit about um, what you had said previously about your point about return on investment here. Yes, well, well, Alejandro and I were talking before the before we started about Dr. Heckman's um, seminal research on the second generation of children who uh, whose parents received early education experiences and the differences in their school experiences, their involvement in the, in the criminal justice system, their involvement in in, in um, employment and education, and their health. In all of those cases, they are doing far better than their controls. And what's really exciting about that is one can imagine that, that that will also be the case for their children and for their children's children. And so really what we think about, and you know, Dr. Heckman and I discussed this, when you have an investment that you make in 1965 that continues to bear returns in 2021 and has every evidence of showing returns into the future, I think that's an infinite ROI. Um, you know, it's a pretty big one, that's for sure. So, Drew, uh, could you just take take that that idea and talk about uh, you know from your perch at uh, Para los, Ni los Niños in Los Angeles, talk about how your constituents think about investing in community through children and through that sort of multi generational impact that that you have. Talk a little bit about the scope of your programs, but also your your perspective in terms of of making that. Uh, investment as if all of your donors, all of your staff were investors in Los Angeles. So, so Mark, you know this from our, we've talked in the past about my background prior to coming with Para Los Niños, where we work with and operate early Head Start, Head Start programs, um, charter schools, youth development programs, and everything in between, um, really to set people up for the opportunity to make choices and, and have a successful path. My experience had been largely in K-12, um, and I used to talk to people about the, the just abysmal funding uh, around K-12, even with the bumps that we get. And, and yes, this is a historic bump. bump with teachers work. funding their own work, right? Absolutely. And then I got more involved and in, in more deep into the early learning world and in early childhood education. And I thought, oh, forget about abysmal. This is criminal. The, the way we think about funding and so the investment piece that I that is very top of mind for, for, for me and I'm sure for my colleagues is if we actually, so let's say we can get the world to understand all the research and, and the application of that research and, and the real world implications of caring more about early, early learning and early childhood education. If we can get them there, then we have to also say, well, what does that mean for who is in the classrooms? And how do we support that workforce? And how do we think about them? Um, not how do we, why don't we? And when will we fund salaries and benefits and all the things that support those as viable long-term careers rather than figuring out how do you get somebody to come work for you because you're offering 10 cents more an hour 
And that's why what you're right, Diana, what a what an auspicious moment we're at now where we're getting people to think about investment in, in early learning, but also giving practitioners and operators the opportunity to to actually get people uh, up up to a, a not not just living wage, but a, a wage and something where they can look at it as a long term career, build a career and really, I think, cement the 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 job choice and career choice of early childhood ed- educator. You know, you're, you're making respected. a really important point. I'm sorry for cutting you off, but I wanted to highlight this and, and have you speak about uh, on it further. You're you're basically saying is that the expertise required to be a really great teacher, to be a really great um, uh, developer of of children and families and so on, we're undervaluing that expertise. We're oh, absolutely. We're, 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 we're undercompensating. We're making it irrational for somebody to to make that a career choice because of that fact, right? We are, and and there's policy decisions where we go on and on about a push to TK as that's the place for kids of a certain age, rather than keeping them in what we know is a developmentally appropriate setting, uh, because somehow that's a more uh, refined or better approach to education and development. It's not that it isn't. But it should, that's not a choice. It's a false choice. Uh, well, so, I, would, I, would, I would completely agree with that. And I would say, because we believe that education begins at birth or even before, that probably the most important teacher in a child's life is the first teacher that the child has, other than its, her, her, her parents, but an early, early child, an infant toddler teacher. And these are the most lowest compensated. It's actually, we've got this backwards. We're paying the college professors the most. And the high school science teacher is second. And the people who do the most profound work are actually getting paid the least. In fact, they're getting paid about the same um, level as, um, as, as dog walkers. We have some tragic stories of um, preschool and early childhood teachers who are making $10 an hour in their primary job of teaching and shaping young minds and $15 an hour at Starbucks where they have to work to supplement their income. There's fascinating research that shows that a child's attachment relationship with her teacher at 18 months is predictive of her feelings about her fourth grade teacher. Just think about that. It means that actually that first relationship with a teacher really sets the foundation for how the child is going to actually enter into school and think of herself as a, as a learner in elementary school and then in beyond. This is when we talk about, you know, setting the trajectory for success. We want to set that with the most important teacher, that first teacher. And those are the lowest paid teachers in our, in our system. Um, early childhood teachers are paid on average half of what kindergarten teachers are paid. Mm-hmm. Alejandro, Diana, I'd like to go, go to you. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. No, no, I, I, th- thank you so much for, you know, talking about elevating the profession. And that is something with, with us in high scope that we've developed a curriculum, but we also believe in professional development. And how do we, it's not just about providing a curriculum. The whole approach is really, how do we invest in educating and in building partnership with teachers and parents to be able to understand how do we talk to children? How do we encourage them versus praising them? How do we build intrinsic motivation? And you're so right, Diana, this all happens, but it just, it has to be a a conjunction of things that come together as we build an early childhood workforce. And like you said too, Drew, how do we actually develop a pipeline of people who stay in early childhood. So, you know, administrators who stay because the profession really gives back. And I think this is a a conversation that we all need to come together and say, why are we having the people who take care of our children? And we all know that in the first five years, most of the synopsis of a human being are built. Yet, like we've all agreed, these are our least paid uh, professionals. And, you know, they are doing a very sophisticated job and are not being noticed by the world. You know, we just completed a uh, survey. I just want to share this with you. And, and Alejandra, I'm going to I'm going to go back to you. Uh, we asked how important are early childhood development programs to a person's success in the judgment of of our attendees uh, here uh, on Zoom. Of course, the people on uh, Facebook, Twitter, and, and YouTube Live uh, can't respond to the poll. Um, we had fully 73% say that that. 
uh, critical, absolutely critical, uh, and deserving of, of a lot of investment. Important, rounded out with uh, with twenty seven percent. Nobody went went lower than um, so. So over two thirds think it's thinks it's critical. The the balance think that it's important. So Alejandra, let's let's talk a little bit about this whole idea of how we shift because we through how, what we purchase, what we pay for, what we invest in, are creating the country that we will inhabit in the future and that our children will inhabit. How should we function? Because we do have so many different priorities. We have uh, uh, climate change and we have, you know, the, the, the shift to uh, renewable energies and we have uh, issues of, of uh, justice and, and all these different issues. Where should we think about children in terms of our investment priorities without um, saying that any one uh, group of, uh, of us deserves everything. We can't, we can't do that. We can't run a, a country um, with an, an, an unbalanced approach, no matter how worthy. How do we think about this? How do we equip ourselves to think about, about how we, we invest more in children in a way that allows us to bridge divides of priorities that we all have? Mark, that's a great question. You know, I think what we need to really focus on is, you know, we talk about high quality early childhood education. What is high quality? That These are markers that we need to make sure that when we're providing children with active learning, when we're providing them with conflict resolution steps, for example, that is, that's a huge component of our approach where we allow children to go through conflict. We teach them how to go through the steps of conflict resolution. We encourage them versus praise, building intrinsic motivation. We do the plan, do review. Everything that they do is with a plan, do review, even as they're infant and toddlers. So what does that mean? We're building executive functions for the child that they're gonna be using as adults. And, and that's really what we need to really think about. What are we providing children? And the beauty, I, I, I've always said, the beauty of HighScope is that the, our approach can be used in, and it's been used in underserved areas, in affluent schools, in religious schools, non-religious schools, because it's an approach of seeing the strengths of the child versus trying to think that we're fixing something because we're not. We're understanding that the child is bringing strengths. The families are bringing strength. So how do we build the high quality programs where we are really building strong children that will be, you know, very giving back as adults, which is really at the end of the, of the day, that's the goal for everyone. How are we building strong adults? So your, your, your point is that we can focus on commonalities, first of all. We don't have to necessarily um, uh, make this into a philosophical issue. If we, if we can think about common skills that we all agree that children need to have as adults, we can focus there and we can focus our attention and investments in those ways and, and basically deploy as much of this to all children children, particularly children in need. Uh, Diana, you, you look like you were about to, to yeah. uh, jump in. Well, I did wanna jump in because I think one of the most important things we have to recognize is that every family and all children need some foundational uh, supports. Families never have raised children by themselves. And um, all of us, even the most resourced families have relied on, on friends and supports and family to help us. Not every family has, not every mother, not every not other parent has those supports. And it is just penny wise and pound foolish for us to punish children because their parents don't have the resources and the supports to allow them to grow up to be productive, contributing citizens and participants in our society. It is, um, it, it, it really does benefit all of us. And so what I think, um, while I think a universal approach is really a wonderful way for us to think about this, I think we also have to be honest about what all children need. All children need safe and supportive homes. They need responsive, um, stimulating environments. And in our full employment society, that means that we need to find a way for all children to be cared for in settings that are educational settings 
regardless of where they are, whether they're in church basements, in people's homes, whether they're in schools or community centers, all of those settings have to be developmentally appropriate, responsive, safe, caring settings. And that takes a huge investment in human capital, in the people who can care for this, for, for those children. The good news in our society is this is one of the few things that cannot be and will not be automated. Love and care of infants and toddlers and young children, the, live, the, ex, the exploration of, um, of, of the physical environment in a safe and supportive way, which is really what learning is all about. That is a human interaction. There are never, we are never gonna automate that work. And what we need to do as a society is learn how to value it. Um, again, the research is very clear. This has been very research, you know, studied and both from an economic and a, and a social perspective. It's a huge lift. And, and I think the huge lift is around building and training the workforce. It's a policy as well as a program um, effort. It's why it start early. We both run programs directly, train other people, and we advocate locally at the state level and in Washington, D.C. for the funds to do this work well and to do it at scale, which is what we need. We need population level impact. Um, at this point, we understand well, we cannot afford to lose so much of our population because they are not um, 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 educated, um, socially and emotionally capable of participating in, um, in, in our economy and in our society. A great setup for the question I wanted to throw over to you, Drew. If you look at Los Angeles and you you take Los Angeles almost as a as a microcosm, it's a mini state uh, basically. Um, talk about Diana's point about where the need is, because where the need isn't, we don't necessarily need to invest further, right? We need to invest where kids are being left behind. Could you just, if you, if you think about your constituents and and the children who um, really do require further investment. What does that look like geographically around Los Angeles, um, rural versus more urban areas, suburban uh, suburban areas, um, uh, uh, questions of, of distribution uh, along racial and income lines? Uh, where, where are children being left behind in, in this in Los Angeles and by extension in this country? Well, that is, well, that's a huge question right there. But um, I, I'm going to start by by kind of building on. Uh, what Diana and Alejandra said, how do you tackle this big of an issue? Um, one, I, I wanted to offer one way that, that we're working on this um, in partnership with communities. And I think all of it sort of boils down to um, understanding uh, a child in the context of their family and a family in the context of community. Um, and we have uh, one of our programs, it's called uh, Best Start uh, uh, program where our, our funder, the North Star in the funding is kindergarten readiness. But the way that we approach that is by partnering with local communities so that parents and families and community residents are setting agendas for what's important for their community. With it's very again, important, that right? Star. It starts with ownership, right? Absolutely. Ownership and, and so the North Star is kindergarten readiness but that doesn't mean everything on the agenda is about kindergarten. That means that that might mean um, access to to the metro line. That might be uh, community violence prevention. That might be uh, opportunities and availability of fresh produce. And those things add to the, the the sort of fabric of a community. And then if if those things are in place, or we're working towards that, then you really do have an area and a, a community that can be united around the things that, that Alejandra and Diana, That's so opportunities for, for youth. You're making connections between nourishment, right? Food deserts, right? And early childhood development. You're making a connection between art and joy and music and early childhood development. You're making a connection between a gun violence and early childhood development, you're you're basically talking about the development of community, and by extension, the development of communities in America, and then and then connecting the dots. Um, yeah, and and to your question, your setup to me earlier was about so where are the where are, where are the gaps, right? So at Palo Los Niños, like many other providers, uh, so we are working with uh, nearly 100 percent of our families 
uh, in our early childhood education, all through throughout all of our program, nearly 100% of them live in circumstances of poverty. And, um, and we see the impact of that, right? But we also don't look at, at the fact that somebody might live in a certain zip code or speak a certain language at home or have some some um, somewhere on the uh, sort of uh, in terms of, of, of their status immigration wise, that those are assets and you build on that and you, you bring that forward and you include that into the work that you're doing and you really empower um, and, and share power, right? It's, it's power building, it's systems change. It's not about we have some answer and we're giving it. It's more about we're partnering shoulder to shoulder with our families um, the the children and the and the rest of the family to really create those opportunities. You know, we asked a a, a question in a previous um, poll about whether we are responsible beyond our own family for for other children, um, and we had near unanimity in part because of this select audience that yes, we are responsible. Um, my question uh, to you, Alejandra, is is that. Uh, we've seen to, over the last uh, 20, 30, 40 years, forgotten that we're a social compact and this idea of us being responsible for people who are not our immediate family, um, that seems to have gone by the wayside. Are we basically weakening, weakening the nation and this being an object lesson by how we think? And really, we should try to invest in others who are not us, particularly if we, if we have the means should we be investing in people who don't have the means, in children in particular, who don't have the means in a selfish sense that we want to have society be stronger and these children who don't have the means are really key to strengthening the country itself? Right, because you know, once again, what the monumental high school pair preschool study has told us this, right? When we invested in, in children and in, children who the school system saw as potentially at risk. And when there was investment in them, we've seen the return upon investment. This is a communal. What do we want at the end? What, you know, the COVID has really taught us is at the end, we want problem solvers. We need people also who can solve conflict. And this is why it's so important that regardless that we provide the, a program, a high quality program to all children uh, regardless of where they are, where they live, that they deserve this because it is at the end of the day, these are our adults that are going to be together, who are going to be the caretakers, who are going to be this. So, so I mean, it just makes sense. There's always a connection from early learning all the way to adult. It K-12 seems to be separated, but really, what do we all need at the end as adults and for our communities? So we're, we just completed another poll, and I'm going to go back over to you, Diana, because you make the point so well. We asked for every dollar invested in quality early childhood programs, what kind of return on investment do we have? And, and about 60% of the people said uh, sixfold to 15-fold. But your previous point was that that's just a way undercount. And, you know, when I look at this, and, and it, it's so interesting, if you look at people who end up with interactions with the criminal justice system, right, these are, are very often people who have had, um, had some serious uh, issues in their early childhood development, right, and in their family stability and with poverty and, and so on, not always. But it, but it strikes one that there is a, a real correlation between uh, certain lived experiences and that result as an adolescent or, or an adult. And then there are other connections that can be made in terms of job, career, earning potential, and so on and so forth. So if you were going to make a guess, and let, let's, let's go away from this sort of infinite return idea, but let's, but, but let's make a guess because tomorrow you, Diana, you, Drew, you, Alejandra, are going to be asking for donations again, right? You're going to be asking investors to help you do your work. What kind of a return on investment really are we talking about for $10 spent uh, today? If I were to write a check of $10 and, and help you do your work. Well, I absolutely defer to uh, Professor Heckman, who's a colleague and a, a dear friend. And, and as I said, he and I have had this debate many times and his work is um, impeccable and it's been very important to us. So I'm not I'm not certainly going to take an um, issue with that with his numbers. 
I think the important thing to recognize as well is that there are very, very few social programs that have the kind of return that early childhood has. And I think the most important message of all of that work is that the brain is plastic and dynamic, that skill begets skill, and that actually investing at the beginning of life, as opposed to trying to remediate problems later, is not only the most cost effective, but it's frankly the most humane and the most, um, and the most efficient way for us to have a just society. And, for, and, and all of this is truly about ensuring that every child has the opportunity to reach her potential. It is about ensuring that um, every um, individual can be whatever um, that individual can be in, in life and that we as a society can, um, can support people and can benefit from the, the, all of the human potential. And that's just essential to the future of our country. Um, uh, if we look at other countries, both developing and developed countries, they provide far more support for children and families in the very first years of life, far more support. There's been a lot written about paid leave, which unfortunately isn't in this package at this point, and how the United States is one of the only developed countries that doesn't provide paid leave. We're one of the few developed countries that doesn't provide universal free early care and education. This is, you know, I mean, this is just penny wise and pound foolish. There's no well, I, have to, I have to endorse that, you know, having uh, lived in a, in a number of different countries in, in Europe and, and other places, it, it's really astounding the difference and the impact that you, that you see on civil society. Drew, if you're going to make one major recommendation, one thing that we can all do and that the U.S. Uh, as a whole, as a family can do, what would that be? What would you suggest that we do tomorrow? All right, so my my I'm gonna I'm gonna answer with two things. Um, okay. My quick one is what we all said earlier is just acknowledge and with action and dollars and focus and respect uh, the 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 career of early childhood educators and the the complexity and the importance of that. And the the other is uh, just a a quick on to what Diana just said. Like we know too much now. We know so much about brain science. We know, and, and Alejandro, you mentioned impact of COVID. We know what trauma does, but we also know how you address it, right? It's, it's caring relationships. It's all the things that we've talked about. We if, actually if, have the answers. We just have to, we have to do it. That's what you're right. saying, well, right? So if, if you let me just do one, one quick part of this. Think about this, like we sports teams spend millions of dollars on physical conditioning and training and all these other things. That's sort of, we're not talking about millions of dollars here for every child. We could be and should be. But if we applied the same sort of scientific approach to repair and support and development of every young person, particularly those most vulnerable, think about the, the, the return on investment there. And, and we know how to do it. We, it's not like we don't know. So, yeah, that's it. Now, the same, same question to you, but I'll add, a, I'll add an additional uh, spin. You know, there is this idea of just becoming um, a, a nanny state, the idea that nobody has to strive because everything gets taken care of. Now, when you're talking about children, children actually need care. Could you give us your sense of what the one thing that we can do to help advance this cause? Well, I'm having a hard time improving on what Drew said. Um, I think that uh, I, would, I would second everything that Drew said. And I would also say that um, this really begins with families, that investing in children means investing in their families and in their home lives and in the parenting that, parent, that, that, that young parents can do. And without question, we cannot think of taking children out of their home settings or out of their communities and you know, injecting information or learning into them. This is about actually creating um, support for families to do their best work to raise their children as well as they can. And Alejandra, um, what, what is your answer to this, to this idea? What do we have to do? So my answer is gonna be connected to, and, and I'm gonna always say about high scope. So, Italy always says that Montessori started in Italy. 
high scope belongs to the United States. So what I'm asking as a nonprofit organization ourselves, everything that we spend comes back to research, the research that we've backed up for 50 years. Invest in our approach. This is an approach. This is a way of thinking about curriculum, developing our professional development, continuing research in our classrooms and in our infant toddler homes. This is invest in high scope. That is my last day to, to, to encourage the, everyone in the United States to be very proud, like Italy holds the Italian flag with Montessori. I want everyone to understand that the high scope approach belongs to the United States. So the, the whole idea of investing in, in what works, right? Invest in what works. I, I think that's such a, such a great way to, to end this. Very, very practical. Invest in what works. It's how we make the country stronger. Alejandra Barraza, president of the High Scope Educational Research Foundation in Slatsky, Michigan. Diana Rauer, president of Start Early in Chicago. And Drew Ferretti, president and CEO of Para Los Niños in Los Angeles. Thank you so much for giving us such a broad sense of, of how you address this, uh, these issues. Please thank your staffs. Please thank your boards. Please thank your donors, your supporters, your communities, and your clients who are actually bearing so much of this burden. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.